The following program contains explicit scenes of protests. If you suffer from cyber paralysis, Randall may not be right for you. Check with your favorite blog. Speaking the truth when others hold their tongues. Wrestling for justice with left-wingers and crocodiles. Resisting the temptation to keep the peace at any price. The man who creates social tension just by walking into the room, Randall Terry. Welcome to today's program, ladies and gentlemen, day 10 of our new Congress. We're one-tenth of the way through in Washington, D.C. It's cold out here, baby. I'm going to talk to you today about Congress, about William Lloyd Garrison, about creating social tension so that we can actually restore the public and not just play games. But first, a word of the day. Hey, hey, a long time no see. Randall, if you run for president and you show your graphic pro-life TV ads, some child-killing crazies are probably gonna hunt you down. You think the Alamo got shot up, or you just wait. But don't you worry, Randall, because I'm fixing to fortify my property. Gonna get me a high-powered generator, gonna double the voltage on my electric fence. You can come down here, hunker down with me. Welcome to today's program, friend. Because of the horrific shooting of Gabrielle Giffords and the six people that have lost their lives, including a federal judge, young girls, just horrifying, you have people on the left that are trying to introduce new gun legislation. You have people saying that it's programs like this that are responsible for these shootings. Of course, what they didn't mention early on is that the sheriff in Arizona who was running his mouth had gotten numerous complaints about Mr. Lofter, this young assassin, and he didn't act on it. He didn't act. And yet we see the left-wing media trying to blame us for this lunatic who might have been schizophrenic. He was surely I mean, in my opinion, it's probably demon-possessed, surely chemically imbalanced, or both. Um, they see, we, we see them trying to blame us for this horrific act. We have to not flinch. Now, I want to use a historic lesson for you. A man named William Lloyd Garrison. William Lloyd Garrison was the most famous abolitionist in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s, until slavery was finally made illegal again. When Nat Turner's rebellion happened, and dozens of people, men, women, and children, lost their lives in the South, William Lloyd Garrison was one of the only anti-slavery people to not blink. He didn't flinch. And what he did was, he condemned what Nat Turner did, but then he turned around and he said, but it is slavery that is the fountain of iniquity, the fountain of violence that has produced the violence that Nat Turner participated in. Because of what William Lloyd Garrison said, there were two states that put a bounty out for his life. Literally, bring him here dead or alive. We want to try him for sedition in our state. He barely escaped with his life to England till things cooled down. But he provides us with an object lesson, namely that we hold to the truth no matter what. We hold to the truth even when the truth is under fire. It's easy for us to talk trash at our water coolers and talk trash on our shows like this. But when what we hold to be dear or fundamental to liberty, such as the defense of human life, our right to protect ourselves, the Second Amendment, and the fact that the Second Amendment is not for duck hunting, and not just for self-defense, but so that we do not become an oppressed people at the hand of our government. When, when those types of things are under fire, that is when we need to hold the line. So I encourage you, please, don't flinch. 
Tea Party friends, pro-life friends, don't flinch. Stand for the truth even when the truth is under fire because in the end, the truth will prevail if we, as her guardians, are valiant in battle. Now, for our Republican friends who use and abuse us, who we, they used us to get to power. One of my favorite songs, The Little Red Dress. For you, John Boehner. You told me that you loved me like no other. Said you would take me home to meet your mother You sang me love songs I turned my back and you were gone I thought what did I do sat there waiting for you Thought we could fix whatever went wrong GOP what did you do to me, GOP? Was blind, but now I see, GOP. You were using me all along. You said you needed me so we could get to power. I gave you my time and money brought me flowers I finally gave you my vote baby that was all she wrote you won't return my calls won't do nothing at all I was part of your wild oats GOP now I know what it means, GOP Was blind, but now I see, GOP You were using me all along Then I started wondering, what does GOP mean? Gathering of peacocks Galloping old pompous windbags Growth on a porcupine, girdle on a pantomime Good old power-hungry granddaddies on Prozac Godless old pusillanimous sax <laughs> G.O.P., that's what you mean to me And baby, I'ma pay you back Hello? Yeah, it's me, who's this? Oh, oh, hi, how have you been? I'm good, thanks. Y you need my help? Um, sure, yeah, no, I'm not busy. No, uh-huh. That old red dress you got me? Yeah, I still have it. Well, sh sure, I'll wear it, uh-huh. All right, okay, yeah. I'll see you in a minute. Yeah, I, I've missed you too. Bye, I, I'll be right over. Thank you very much. Yes, written by yours truly. I love you, Mr. Boehner. All right, I'm gonna take a quick break. When we come back, Ask the Doctor. Another new segment with Dr. Alan Keyes. Don't go away. Randall and I made a trip to Washington to visit FDR. While there, Randall told him that Alger Hiss was a communist. The president threw us out of his office. Moron. Moments with Moses. And you shall pine away in your enemies' lands because of their iniquity. And also because of the iniquities of their fathers, they shall pine away like them. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. It is I, your servant, Randall, with yet another segment of Ask the Doctor, Dr. Alan Keyes. <laughs> you know, I think one of the happiest days of my life every year is when I feel my heart palpitating and I go to the post office with that big envelope with my tax return. 
wondering if I'll be audited, wondering if the IRS is going to stick a microscope up my nose and down through my body to see if I filled out every part of that form just right. I love knowing that Big Brother knows so much about me. Don't you? Uh -huh. uh, it's a tough crowd. Anyway, there is a growing concern, and it, 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 it had its moment, and then it petered out, unfortunately, with the, uh, with the fair tax leadership issue, in my opinion. But we need to get rid of the IRS, yes or no? Well, definitely, but I think that the notion that you can get rid of the IRS and keep the income tax is false. So when you say get rid of the IRS, you mean get rid of the income tax. Bingo, exactly. But second, here's a question. That's I why have. he needs to diagnose me and no, not but, me him. Thank you. But this is, this is the question I have with respect to all of this. Before we get to the question of the money and the tax rate and all of this, I have a simple question. I believe that somewhere in the Constitution of the United States, I think it's the, the, um, the uh, Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment, uh, it says that... Um, Oh, it's the Fifth Amendment. That's what it means by taking the Fifth. Oh, yes, Alan, right. <coughs> it says Search and seizures that we for the, cannot, you can't incriminate yourself. You cannot be compelled to provide evidence against yourself, to provide testimony against yourself. Now, the last time I looked, when we submit that income tax form, we sign it at the bottom, and it actually represents an oath or affirmation. Mm -hmm. We are giving testimony. And that testimony, when we sign it, we swear to the truth of the testimony as to what our income was uh, in, in, a given in the given period. Uh, now, as I understand it, uh, you can't be compelled to do that. Mm. So if it's compulsory, if you have to turn that form in and you are compelled to do so under penalty of law, then that violates the Constitution. And if you are not compelled to do so under penalty of law, then does that mean you turn it in when you feel like it and don't turn it in if you don't feel like it? I, I don't quite have never understood how they get away with forcing us to do something. By the way, that as I understand it, I remember going on Sean Hannity's show some time back. Who's a better in, host, me or Sean? In 2008. No, come on, answer the question, Doctor. Uh, well, I think you're better, but oh, that thanks. I, uh, I feel better. I, I can explain why too. But the <laughs> the point being, better I was on, on his radio program, I think, some time back, and and I love Sean. I, I got to mentioning this, and he and. Uh, and he looked at me and said, uh, well, if you implement this proposal, and what proposal was he talking about? I had simply said that if I were to be elected president, I first, one of the first things I'd do is I would mandate that at the top of every form that had to do with the income tax, they would place a version of the Miranda warning. <laughs> no, so, no, I don't know why people laugh. You have the right to remain silent. If you're guilty of a crime in this country, if you're accused of a crime, if you may be guilty of murder, of some horrible disease, the, the, uh, the, the police are required to warn you of these rights. So law-abiding citizens, guilty of nothing except, oh, I made a living last year. Mm, shame That's on you. That's a crime. So people who are guilty of nothing except making a living, they don't get to be warned that they have the right to remain silent? That if they give up that right, anything uh, they say can be used against them in the court of law? They don't? I think they do. And I would give them that. And, and you know what Sean said? Sean said, but Alan, what would happen to the collections in the income tax? Yeah. <laughs> Sean, maybe the result would be that we'd have to institute a constitutional way of funding the federal government. That would be good. The founders actually came up with one, by the way. And it one that is premised on something far great, more important. Right now, if we do badly, the government does well. Have you ever noticed that? That, that they mm. actually keep on taking more and more, uh, uh, relatively speaking, because we're making less and less, so they get more and more of the proportion of what we do make. And, and the sad thing is that they keep on doing it whether times are good or bad. If you had something like a fair tax proposal where the government's revenue depended on how much was being circulated in the marketplace, the sales going on mm -hmm, out there, mm -hmm. they could only make money if everybody was making and spending money. Right. So when they implemented proposals that choked off our productivity, that destroyed the incentives of production, that interfered with the ability to capitalize new investment, they wouldn't get any revenue <laughs> because they would be destroying the goose that laid the right, golden right. egg. I think that the founders were right. That's the healthier way to do it. That way, when people are deciding about We're talking about, about taxes, impost, exposed, uh, impost, tariffs. Impost, excise taxes. Yeah, excise taxes. Uh, uh, basically what we would call sales taxes, uh, and, and, and tariffs and duties. Right? And, and people will say, well, that's going to be protectionism and so forth. No, it's not. Is it protectionism when somebody who owns a mall charges 
the people who set up stores, they were a little fee for being there? I don't think we call that protectionism. I think we call that rent. Now, why should people be able to come set up shop in the American consumer arena and sell stuff to our people without paying rent to keep the lights on, help pay for the security of the place, and so forth and mm. so on? Uh, I think we've been given a free ride to folks all around the world so that they can develop off the back of our economy for long enough. We're helping China. Uh, and, and, uh, and I also think, by the way, that this would spell an end almost right away to our present crisis. Because our present crisis is due to the chokehold of government domination. We are out of time. I'm going to ask Dr. Keyes tomorrow about the fair tax, about China, about foreign relations based upon Christian ethics, not raw power. Until then, I hope you feel better because you join me with a visit to the doctor, Dr. Alan Keyes. Thank you, doctor. <laughs> I'll be right back. Success cannot be guaranteed. There are no safe battles. Sir Winston Churchill. Welcome back to today's program, friend. Remember to go to terrycast.com and invest in the fur coat fund. It's cold out here, and I want to look good. All right, we are in a crisis as a nation, and I, I actually ask your forgiveness for becoming a little bit repetitive at points, but there are themes that bear repeating. In fact, the Apostle Peter, when he wrote, I think it was in 2 Peter, he said, for me to write the same thing to you is not burdensome to me, and it's necessary for you. Truth has within it the seeds of its own victory. Lies have within them the seeds of their own destruction. The issue is this. Will people courageously say the truth even when it's under fire? So yesterday we discussed H.R. 217, which I urge you to read. And we saw that it's crumbs. It doesn't defund Title X. They're still going to distribute birth control all over the country with your money. They're going to give money to hospitals that kill babies. But it's a, at least a small step, all right? If the bill was passed, it would have a dramatic impact against Planned Parenthood, and that's a good thing. So my point is we need to say the truth about what this bill is not. It's not a grand victory. It's a small step. But we also need to fight for it tooth and nail and hold our congressmen accountable. If you want to send a letter, by the way, we created a tool for you. If you want to send a letter to every member of Congress, you can go to terrycast.com and for pennies per congressman, a fax will go shoo, right to their machine. Tell them what you think. It's way cheaper than sending a letter to everyone and emails just get delete, 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 deleted. But a fax is actually read by a staffer. Go to terrycast.com and take advantage of that tool. But beyond that, go to your phone, 202-224-3121. Here's a call to action for you. Call up your U.S. House member and tell them, number one, vote for Mr. Pence's uh, bill, H.R. 217. But also tell them, don't vote for any budget or any continuing resolution that gives money to Planned Parenthood. If the Republican Party can control the House of Representatives and not defund Planned Parenthood, then they are liars and hypocrites. It's all a scam. And I'm tired of scams. I'm going to take a quick break. Be right back. Appoint a wicked man against him. Let an accuser bring him to trial. When he is tried, let him come forth guilty. Let his prayer be counted as sin. Patrick Henry said, I know no way of judging the future, but by the past. Profound words, simple. Let's apply them to today. If you look at when the United States House of Representatives both members, or both chambers of Congress, the Senate and the House, were controlled by Republicans. What happened? We went further into debt. We funded Planned Parenthood with hundreds of millions of dollars. And they said to us, we're your pro-family, pro-life heroes. 
So if we're going to judge the future by the past, then we're in for another colossal defeat. The Tea Party, God bless us all, has provided fresh impetus, fresh, impetus, fresh vigor, fresh passion at the ballot box. But now it needs to happen in lobbying, in phone calls, in faxes, in telling them, do what we say or we will throw you out just as fast as we threw out the Democrats. Friend, fight.